what goes through a person's mind sometimes? That really is the question, isn't it? And one that can be asked of any of us, and all of us. And is the theme of the two stories that I have in store for you this evening, both from Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so you can share your stories with me and I could read them all to you. Two intriguing titles for you. Firstly, we have The Diary of a Downward Spiral, and that's followed by Erin Mould. Two delicious treats in store for you this evening, I can tell you, and a little bit more dark and disturbing than those I would normally read. So, my dear friends, it's once again time to sit back and relax with your favourite drink, and Listen. Personal Diary of Felicity Beaumont, March 21st. Dear Diary, oh God, I haven't done something like this since I was a little girl. It just sounds so silly coming from me now. It's amazing how life can change in the blink of an eye. A couple of months back, I was in peak physical condition, training to run a marathon. Now I'd be lucky to hobble to the bathroom. How did this all happen? Well, that's a good question. I can hardly remember myself. The last thing I remember is visiting a friend's house for a Christmas party, and then waking up in the ICU barely being able to move. To my understanding, black ice was the culprit. I guess it was the airbag that saved my life, or what was left of it. So, here I am now. Doctors recommended that I start writing things down. They say it will help me better keep my emotions in check and maybe even jog my memory. <laughs> jog my memory. Maybe I should choose my words a little more carefully. Everyone tells me how lucky I am to be alive. But you know what? That's bullshit supposed to tell the truth here, if only here. Anyone who thinks we're lucky for just existing is too stupid to understand that there are in fact worse things than dying. I haven't slept well for months now. The funny thing about tossing and turning is that you don't start to appreciate it until you can't do it anymore. And I keep hearing voices coming from upstairs. When I finally do get to sleep, I'm haunted by hellish nightmares of the accident. The same horrifying images played on loop each time. My body being meshed and compressed along with the cold, hard steel from the car. My body and it forming some kind of demented sandwich. Every morning I wake up and spend a good minute or so trying to force myself out of bed, eager to pour myself a cup of coffee and take on the day. The sight of my bed sores and the agonizing pain that comes with them snack me back to reality really quick. Okay, okay. Enough negativity for today. I have to remember what the psychologist said. Try your best to focus on the positive. Well, I hate to break it to you, Doc. Once you've been run off the road going 70 miles an hour, the rose-tinted spectacles you've been wearing your entire life tend to turn to shit. So here I am now, laying in a hospital bed set up in my family room. I can't even go upstairs to my own bedroom. With a string of burglaries that's been going on lately, anyone could get in here in the middle of the night, and I'd be completely helpless. My husband, Jack, said he'd take care of it, though, and make sure nothing happens to me. At the very least, I guess I do in fact have him to be thankful for. I'll tell you what, if it wasn't for him, I don't know what I would have done. The poor thing was in the passenger seat that night. He'd had too much to drink that night and was riding shotgun. I've seen pictures of what's left of the car, and believe me when I tell you that that side took the brunt of it. The luck on my hubby, though. Other than some bumps and bruises, he'll be back to his old self in no time. Even though he wasn't driving, I think he still feels a little guilty for what happened. He has to work a lot, but he made sure to get me the most expensive caretaker he could find to watch over me when he can't be there. She seems great, I'll give her that. But for the money, I would think she would have a slightly better attendance record. God, what was her name again? Alexa something or other. My mind is drawing a blank right now. Although the doctors won't admit it. 
I think this medicine is fucking with my head. It always has. But what can I do? I've got to take it. Asthma in a bed-ridden patient is a big no-no. The last thing I need is to catch pneumonia. Thank goodness for Jack and Alexa. They make sure I never miss a dose. Well, I think that's enough for now. I'm kind of tired. Hopefully, I won't need this hospital bed much longer. Oh, I miss going upstairs and sleeping next to Jack. Oh, it's too bad this damn hospital bed was only built for one. March 28th. Dear Diary. No. You know what? Dear God, I wish I was dead. Why couldn't he just kill me and be done with it? There's a lot of things I can put up with, but there is a limit to this nightmarish hell that I'm willing to endure. Did I even tell you I can't even wipe my own ass anymore? Nurse or no nurse, I don't care if you have a whole squad of caretakers on standby. Words cannot even begin to describe how much that hurts your pride. But wait, <laughs> there's more. I had myself a little accident today. Alexa sat me up on the toilet today to my, do my business. Everything was going okay until the telephone started to ring. I don't know what possessed her to do this, but she left me in there alone while she ran to get it. I wound up falling at a weird angle and banging my face against the sink. Now I look like I went 15 rounds with Mike Tyson. The three of us had a talk about it when Jack got home from work. Turns out she was under orders from him to make sure the phone got answered. Well, I guess he was expecting an important phone call. I'm glad to know Jack's job takes precedent over me. It's nice to know where I stand. <laughs> where I stand. Look at me there. I go again. I talked to him about it after she left. He apologized profusely and promised that from now on, Alexa is under no circumstances to talk on the phone when I'm in her care. That was all I got, and I'm sorry, and an assurance that it wouldn't happen again. My head was killing me, and he didn't even offer to massage my neck or anything. He told me he would have his Amazon Echo to remind him to pick up some cream for my eye. I don't think Jack realizes that I can still remember where he keeps his gun. He's lucky I can't get up out of this bed for myself. This room could use some redecorating. And I think my brains would be the perfect shade of red. I'm no gun expert. But I did in fact take a photography class in high school. The general idea is basically the same. You just point and shoot. April 20th. Dear duck. You know what? Forget it. That's too childish. Down to business. I'm sorry it's been so long since I last wrote. I promised the doctor I'd try to maintain a more consistent schedule. It's all been for good reason, though, I assure you. Sorry about my last post. I was in a very dark place. But I've had some good long sessions with my psychologist. And after a swift medication change, I think I'll be okay. Plus, where my future once seemed bleak and uncertain, I now have a glimmer of hope. I've been working extra hard, both at physical therapy and back at home here with Alexa. I'm proud to report that some of my movement has started to come back. I'm now able to hoist myself up in bed and sit up for a little bit. The doctors were very pleased with me. They said if I keep this up, I might even be able to walk again. Granted, it would most likely be with a cane, and I wouldn't be running a marathon any time soon. But it would be so nice to be able to walk upstairs again, to get to sleep in my own bed. Unfortunately, that's where the good news stops. I wish Jack would have been more excited. He barely said two words on the ride home. He was too preoccupied with his own damn phone. Must have taken us 20 extra minutes to get home. We hit every goddamn red light on the way. If he wasn't checking a text, he was yelling into that stupid thing. Siri, do this. 
Siri, remind me about that. Talk to me, you son of a bitch. I might have banged my head a little in the accident, but I'm not an idiot. I'm your wife. Let me help you. Take your eyes off the damn phone and talk to me. At least, tell me who you're texting. That might be something to talk about. But no. He's been so secretive lately, and I can't stand it. Ever since the accident, he's been this way. He says he loves me, but his heart just isn't in it. At first, I was grateful he got Alexa to help me out. But now I'm starting to think it was just more convenient for him to pay someone rather than deal with me himself. I don't know. I guess I'm done for now. I'm exhausted. Those damn voices won't let up. April 27th. I haven't been sleeping well lately. Remember about the voices I was hearing? I feel like they're getting louder. I didn't get to sleep until about 5am this morning. Jack keeps saying he doesn't hear anything. I don't know he can't. I swear they must be coming right from our room keeps telling me that I'm just dreaming it. But I can tell the difference between dreams and reality. I'm only having one dream, and it's still the nightmare of the accident. And these voices are all too real. One of these days, I'll be strong enough to get out of this bed, and I'm going to confront them. I know that I'm not crazy. Alexa didn't show up today. According to Jack, she wasn't feeling well, so it was just the two of us. I must admit, today he did seem to be a bit more attentive than normal. We actually had a halfway pleasant day. Even though I was pretty tired, he actually managed to take my mind off it. He was just like he was when he carried me through the door when we first bought the house. and He placed me into the passenger seat of his convertible. We had a pleasant drive in the country, and for dinner he took me where we had our first date. He apologized for being so tied up with work lately, and presented me with a bottle of perfume, both as a gift for doing so well with my therapy, and an apology. The bottle was partially empty, but I didn't care. This stuff isn't easy to find anymore. He said he got it at a garage sale. He knows how much I love the old-fashioned stuff. At least he was thinking of me. I was so excited, I could hardly contain myself. Oh, I think that's enough for now. It's nice not being able to sleep from excitement. I never thought I'd feel this way again. April 28th. God damn it. Son of a bitch, I can't believe it. Does he think I'm some kind of idiot or something? I refuse to put up with this. Alexa came back to work today. She smelled awfully familiar. Cannot believe that I didn't notice this before. That bitch was wearing perfume. The same kind that Jack claimed he'd found for me. Oh, I'll bet he looked really hard, all right. I can't believe I didn't see it before. Alexa's absences. Jack's clandestine phone calls. Him being constantly preoccupied. And those voices... I wasn't imagining them at all, and that bastard tried to have me thinking maybe I really was imagining it. I'm not going to stand for this. Literally. If I wasn't determined to walk again before, I, uh, I am for sure now. I'm not going to let him make a fool out of me. He will pay for this. May 26th. I think this will be my last entry for a while. Sorry I've been gone so long again. I had to take some time to myself. It's all been worth it, though. Unfortunately for my husband, my dreams have been coming in nice and clear lately. I remember everything now. That night of the accident, my husband was in the passenger seat after he put himself there. One of us drank too much that night, and it was him. I was never the designated driver. 
I had been training harder than I ever thought possible, both at therapy and here at home. I decided to put my sleepless nights to good use and get in some extra exercise. No one knows this. Not Alexa. Not my husband. Nobody. I can walk again. I've had to hide it from everyone. I'm not in tip-top shape yet. My balance is very shaky, and I'm not the fastest. But I think I can do the stairs. I can hear the two of them talking up there right now. I think I'll drop in and pay them a little visit. Oh boy, are they going to be surprised. I found where Jack moved his gun. I guess he wasn't as good as hiding as he thinks he is. It's time to end this. I hope he burns in hell for what he did to me. To whoever reads this first, my doctor, the authorities, I'm sorry, but this was the only way. The following day. This is the Channel 7 News Bulletin Special. We begin tonight with the tragic story of a domestic abuse situation turned deadly. 32-year-old Felicity Beaumont was found dead late yesterday afternoon after her caretaker arrived late for a shift to find her laying motionless at the bottom of the stairs, clutching a 9mm pistol in her hand. Her husband, 34-year-old Jack Beaumont, was found clinging to life in the couple's bedroom after suffering a severe gunshot wound to the chest. When he was discovered, he could still be heard muttering into his Amazon Echo, saying, Alexa, dial 911. Authorities believe Ms. Beaumont to have been brandishing the firearm when she slipped down the stairs, causing her to break her neck. I feel like I should post this all now, as this may be my only chance to tell anyone of my experiences here. I'm covered in blood, and I'm sure the cops are going to come as soon as the next shift shows up. First off, my name's John Miller, and I began working at Whispering Grove University as a night security guard about six months ago, after an interesting stint of government work, details of which I probably shouldn't disclose here. It was an easy job, and it paid enough to live on. I figured I could use some normalcy, though. Well, normalcy is what I got up until recently. I was supposed to patrol the campus and verify that all of the doors were locked. The rest of the time I could just mess around and more or less do whatever I wanted, as long as every so often I walked around the campus. Like I said, easy. Being a school, however, I wasn't allowed to carry any weapons. Of course, I felt naked without my knife. So, everything was fine and dandy until about a week ago. That's when I started to hear footsteps coming from upstairs when I checked the lower rooms. There were only two floors, and up until then, I thought everything was brick or cement. The footsteps sounded like a child running on hollow wood. Being the skeptic that I am, I decided to go check. I figured some kids had sneaked in, and I must have missed a door and left it unlocked, even though I always, always check the upper floor first. Oh, how wrong I was. Judging by the direction of the sound, it must have come from room 1283. It was locked. Oh, I'm nothing if not thorough, so I unlocked it with some difficulty and went inside. Usually the master key opens just about everything on campus. Not this door. It ended up being a small key I'd never used, about halfway through my key ring of like 30 or 40 keys. The door stuck and I yanked it open as though it hadn't been used in years. I later found out that was because it hadn't. So I got it open and went inside. For a fairly well-kept school, it looked like something from an abandoned elementary school. I persisted, though. When I went in further and climbed the three small steps, I found old computers and video equipment pointed at the wall. VHS tapes. I had nothing to watch them on, so I locked the room and continued the night as if nothing had happened, pushing through the sinking feeling in my gut. 
now. Side note. I realise that I forgot to explain the shifts we work here, so here's the breakdown. Three guards work 7am to 3pm. Three work 3pm to 11pm. And I work 11pm to 7am. We have a skeleton crew, so I usually work by myself. Sometimes I have to give up days off, but the overtime pay is nice, and it keeps the lights on at home. Not that anyone's there to use them. Well, back to the story at hand. So I went out the next day before work to a local pawn shop and found a VCR. I brought it with me that night to work, and plugged it into the small TV in the security office. I was going to figure out what room 1283 was, but first, a cigarette. Apparently, it wasn't just room 1283 that wasn't normal about the campus, as when I went out for a cigarette, I ended up having a polite but terrifying conversation with a very proper-sounding talking boar, making his way through the campus to the grove out back that the school was named for. We more or less just exchanged pleasantries once I had come to terms with the fact that it would be rude not to return his greeting. It takes a lot to rattle me. I guess... I just had to adjust. I needed the job, and he didn't seem to be malevolent. His name was Ralph. (laughs) I'm aware I probably sound crazy, but one of the afternoon guards, an older man named Jerry, confirmed that the grove out back attracted all sorts of oddities at night, and so the old buildings and the electrical grid were arranged in such a way to amplify that. So, I went back to 1283 after breezing through my rounds for the night. I was on a mission. I got into the room once again, pushed through the chill in the air and the knots in my stomach, grabbed the VHS tapes in a small trash can from the room, locked the door and headed back to the office. Most were ruined from age, but one was not. On this tape, I saw unspeakable acts. Brutal, violent acts committed in the adjacent room and recorded through a hole into 1283. It began with a man dressed as a Catholic priest, standing in the middle of a tiled room with a drain in the floor. There were shackles hanging from the ceiling that looked like something from at least a century ago. A young man was dragged into the room by another man in a hooded robe. The kid looked emaciated, like he hadn't eaten in days, and was dirty. The hooded man locked his hands into the shackles and left. The priest took a wicked-looking knife from somewhere in his robes, and the rest of the tape was the priests removing the boy's skin while laughing. The boy's screams were going to stick with me for a while. He finally, unceremoniously, slit the boy's throat so deep that his head almost came completely off. I puked. I had to find out what this was. An elaborate prank to scare me? Or something darker? If it was a joke, it was the most realistic looking act I'd ever seen. I spent the majority of the next few days at the public library, reading book after book and scouring website after website. It turns out that Whispering Grove used to be a facility for the care of gifted children. What I'd seen was not care, and there was a special hate in my heart for someone who could do things like this to a child. The staff, now mostly dead, were funded by the church and apparently paid extra to assist and keep silent when the priest made his visits. Those bastards. They'd apparently remodeled when they were about to shut down, as well as reflooring and boarding and painting over the studio windows. No wonder it wasn't obvious. I brought some food for Ralph and his family. I met him outside at our usual meet-up time and plied him with the food in exchange for information. The priest's name was Gabriel. He didn't know the last name. Damn it. Well, I gave him some apples as promised. My past work taught me anything. It was that networking was important. And that night, I went back to 1283 after hearing more scampering footsteps. The boy on the tape hadn't been the only one, and I had to figure out how to help these children. When I walked in, the room was colder than normal. I could see my breath inside. 
it's July and 85 degrees outside. I googled how to contact spirits, but most of it was bullshit make-believe. I was going to have to wing it. Something I did worked, though all I did was walk in and loudly proclaim, I'm here to help. I immediately felt a breeze and a ceiling panel rattled. The lights flickered and dimmed. I had a flashlight, but this is exactly what I'd asked for. I wasn't the enemy. Much to my horror, a skinless boy with his head flopping around crawled out of the now discarded ceiling panel. He didn't move quite right, but I suppose that was to be expected. He scurried down the wall and onto the floor, coming to meet me at eye level. I'm not a small man, so this teenager had clearly already gone through his growth spurt. He gurgled while trying to speak. He clearly hadn't used his voice in a while. While he tried clearing his throat more, he pointed to a chair, then up to the panel he'd come from. He wanted me to go up there. Oh, fuck no. But it seemed that I had to. So I moved the chair over, climbed onto it, and stuck my head into the ceiling while turning on my flashlight. I almost shit my pants as the light came on, and I was face to face with a semi-transparent girl, no more than six years old. She was smiling at me. When she moved out of my way, I guess she knew what I was doing. I saw the rope burns on her neck. I hated this priest more and more with each passing minute. I swallowed my anger and looked past the girl into what seemed like an old boarded up air vent. God, there were so many bones. Clearly this was the dumping ground for the remnants. So many kids had suffered here and were clearly trapped. When I came back down, the boy had found his voice, raspy as it still was. I it was a bit unnerving to see a mostly severed head speak. Later, he said in a voice that sounded like sandpaper. He pushed through with short sentences, punctuated by long pauses. For now, St. Peter's Church. Then Bones, we know who you are. The words clearly came at great difficulty. But I knew what he wanted. This sick asshole was still alive. And I was supposed to fix that. Maybe I'm crazy. Because I was going to do it. Apparently the time had gotten away from me. Because, for whatever reason, Jerry had decided to come in early today. Not only that, he decided to look around for me. Well, he got more than he'd intended when he came up the stairs, though. If I thought the spirit of the boy was unnerving before, I was certainly scared shitless when the ghost boy heard Jerry calling out my name, presumably after seeing the light on in the room. The boy's face twisted into a horrible mask of rage as he launched himself out the door and onto Jerry. The lights went out, and it was darker than it should have been. Jerry screamed that sickening, gut-wrenching scream of imminent death. By the time I'd gotten out of the room, Jerry was at the bottom of the stairs. He wasn't moving, and the spirits were gone. I closed the room and called the cops. Apparently, a 76-year-old man having a heart attack was sufficient enough for their medical examiner's research. I told them I'd heard him yell for me, and by the time I'd come out... I'd seen him at the bottom of the stairs. Well, not too far from the truth, but not too close either. And that was yesterday. I found St. Peter's Church this morning. I hadn't slept, so it wasn't difficult to play the flustered co-worker that needed a priest for a cleansing of demonic energies. What a crock of shit. But I expressed an affinity for Father Gabriel and was assured that he would arrive during my shift. Hmm, awful late for an old man. Awful early for an old monster. Dues had to be paid in full, and I was going to collect. I'd been offered the day off, but declined as well, I needed the money, 
which wasn't a complete lie. I went out for my smoke at the start of my shift and spotted Ralph. He told me to go to the groves before the night's events. How had he known? Hm, smart pig. I did as he said. The grove was aptly named, as when I entered, I heard constant unintelligible whispering. It was after a moment the glint of something shiny caught my eye from across the clearing. I made my way over to it and picked up a knife so long and sharp it could have been classified as a sword. Not knowing what else to do, I thanked the trees, hid the knife in my backpack, and made my way to the front of the building just as Father Gabriel arrived, emerging from the car before telling them to come back in the morning. He figured this was going to take all night. Little did he know, it would take the rest of his life. I had to mask my intentions. I shifted my expression to that of timid concern and fear. I'm here now, my child, the old man said with an airy tone of superiority. I threw up in my mouth a little at the attempted relation. I walked him through the rest of the school first so as not to alert him of my intentions. Pointless conversations about nothing the entire time as he made a show of pretending to cleanse the campus and banish evil spirits. The worst evil there was him, but not for long. If he was worried as we approached 1283, then he hid it professionally. It was getting harder to hide my intentions and disgust, and I could feel the temperature dropping. He must have felt it too. Maybe he was complacent and oblivious. As he rounded the corner, I wound back and hit him in the head as hard as I'd ever hit anything before. I put my whole body into it, and he crumpled. He woke at about 3am. I couldn't use the room he'd used, as it was carpeted now, so I used a staff shower. He woke up and started freaking out when he realised he was tied to the shower head. I pulled out the knife, and he started screaming. I couldn't help but laugh as I cut his skin off his screams only fueling my laughter and drive to continue. This was my errand mort, my honour killing. I was the vengeance the children needed, and he felt that fact. He died within the hour. It took me about another hour to bag up all the bones, videotapes and the priest's robes. I took them out behind the grove to burn them, when I got back to the office to await my fate with the cops, as I had no way to dispose of a body, I picked up his wallet. An old, yellowed picture fell out. It was a picture of him, and the boy, and the hooded man. But the hooded man was uncloaked, and he looked an awful like a younger version of Jerry. A couple of weird and wonderful stories there for you on this evening. Um, thoughts, feelings, comments in the comment section below the video, and I'll do my best to join in the chat as I can. Well, just a reminder that I am on Patreon, and your support is very, very, very much appreciated. Those of you that come over there and send a dollar or two my way, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. But of course, anything that causes you financial hardship, that's not what I want at all. So. If you can't help me out financially, then click like, leave a comment. All those things really do help me in the long run. Love you all, guys. Thanks for your support. And of course, I will see you again very, very soon. But until then, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, 
Send it to Dr. Creepin's vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, looking forward to seeing you all again real soon. So, come check me out, okay? <laughs>